I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Hello, and welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and um, every week I get to introduce you to extraordinary women, women who've taken charge in their lives, women who have educated themselves, basically women who awakened, who've said, I'm here to make a difference and I'm a change maker. So I want you to know about them because what I really want is for you to understand that they're just examples. They're showing you that anything's possible. So I hope that you come back every week and meet another fabulous woman. We're on Spotify and iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, YouTube. Just come back and subscribe and meet the women. You can also go to CynthiaJames.net. I have lots of gifts there for you, and I have a monthly newsletter, and uh, you can know what I'm doing in my world um, and what's happening in my community. So today, I want you to meet this lovely woman. Her name is Michaela Haas. She's a PhD and is an award-winning solutions reporter and author of four nonfiction books, including most recently, Bouncing Forward, The Art of Science of Cultivating Resilience, and Bikini Power, 12 Extraordinary Women Shaping the Transmission of Buddhism in the West. She's also a contributing editor for David Byrne's Reason to be Cheerful, and works as a freelance West Coast reporter for international media. In the U.S., her articles have appeared in the New York Times, Al Jazeera, Rotary International, the Huffington Post, CBS, and a lot of other media. Oh, and by the way, she's an award winner. Professional Excellence Award 22-23 from the Foreign Press Correspondents Association and Club. She's a winner, ASJA Health Writing 2022, and first place environmental reporting, LA Press Club 2020. Michaela, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You have a wonderful podcast. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited to meet you and to talk about a lot of things. But the first thing I want to do is, is I, I really want you to share with people how you grew up. You know, I mean... I'm sure you didn't come on the planet saying, hey, you know, I'm going to be an award-winning journalist. How did you grow (laughs) up? Where did you grow up? I kind of grew up like the furthest away from here you can imagine. I grew up in a small Bavarian village, 200 inhabitants, 300 cows, one church, one pub. (laughs) So (laughs) I think that is the reason why I started traveling and writing and interviewing people, because the, the village where I grew up was very small, idyllic, but very small. And from a young age on, I escaped through books. I read all, all the books I could find about other countries and people who lived differently than I lived. And as soon as I turned 18, I started traveling. I took three months off every year. I lived in Asia a couple of years. I was a correspondent in the south of France for five years, and now I've been on the west coast of the U.S. for 15 years. So I am the only one of my relatives who moved further away than 20 miles of where my father was born. So I moved very far away. (laughs) Well, you came to be an adventurer. That's clear to me. So I want to know, how did you get into journalism? I mean, because it's it's a very interesting field, and I will talk about that a little bit, but how did you get into journalism? I actually started writing for the local paper when I was 16 because I was very politically motivated, and at the time, apartheid in South Africa was going on, and there was an event in the little town close to us about apartheid. And a a speaker from South Africa was going to be there. And I was the only attendee. Nobody else seemed to have been interested in uh, the apartheid, anti apartheid movement at the time. And the only other person who was there was the local reporter. So I said, Oh, I'd love to be a reporter, you know, when I grow up. And he said, Well, why don't you come by and I'll introduce you? And I still can't believe that the chief editor of that local paper actually said, You know what? Um, Why don't you go and write about? 
this uh, poet who's coming to town next week. And I did. And it started from there. And I just enjoy probably like you talking with people who are so interesting, who are doing things to make the world a better place. And I feel very privileged that I, you know, I've been doing that for decades now. Well, I love that. But I just want to tell you, I'm pretty sure that person saw your passion. <laughs> yeah, probably. Because <laughs> I think it's all over you. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, and what an opportunity to take someone who's that young, who's got that kind of passion and invite them into something that really calls them. So I, I, I love that. I So, OK, you're writing at 16. And you start traveling, but how, how, do, how do you keep being a journalist? Did you go to school? What, what happened? Yeah, I went to journalism school. I studied journalism and politics. And then I immediately got a job at the um, at a nationwide newspaper as a reporter. I worked as an in- investigative reporter. I also, at the same time, actually got my own TV show at, at 23 in Germany, which uh, I'm more of an introvert person. I like writing about other people. So here I had to put myself into the spotlight, which was interesting as well. And then, yeah, I started traveling because I always wanted to visit the places I had read about in my books. I had a a special fascination for Asia. I lived in India and Nepal for several years, and I just really enjoyed getting to know other cultures, other people. And, and, you know, in Bavaria, um, I didn't even know there were other religions besides the Catholic Church until (laughs) I started reading books. It was just a... It was a wonderful world, but also a very conservative world. And I I really wanted to explore other cultures, other beliefs, other ways of thinking. Yeah, well, so I want to talk about your books, but I really want to ask you in this moment, you know, journalism today, there's a lot of, there's a whole spectrum of what people think about journalists. (laughs) And, and, And so for you today, not only being a journalist, but being a woman, you know, how do you navigate all these interesting waters with people not even understanding the power of, of journalists? I think I might not be so passionate about my job anymore had I not pivoted to solutions journalism five years ago. And that's a very specific kind of journalism that kind of saved me professionally, uh, I would say, because it's about, it's not good news like fluffy kittens. It's rigorous solutions to urgent vaccine problems, effective, uh, rigorously researched solutions that are effective and reproducible. And that's what I do now. And that means that almost every day, several times a week, I get to speak with people who are working to make a difference. And whether it's uh, healthcare, whether it's a climate crisis, whether it's pollution or whatever it is, you can be sure whether it's war, you can be sure there are people who are working to have a positive impact to making a change uh, for, for a positive development. And so that's the people I get to speak with. And I think it's important as a journalist, you know, not just, we, we talk about the negativity bias, you know, negative news might get more clicks online. But solutions journalism means that actually readers spend more time on the page um, because we find that people really want solutions. They don't just want to be told that the climate crisis is bad. They want to be told what's being done about it. And that's how I really, really came to appreciate and love solutions journalism. And I get to do that um, amongst other places at Reasons to be Cheerful, which David Byrne started, Talking Hats, David Byrne, he started it for the same reasons. He saw people getting depressed over the news. And it's important to also tell the other side of the story, to tell the story, the ideas of people and community who are working to make a a difference. Well, I'm so grateful that you're doing that and you're so passionate about it because here's the thing, there's so much information bombarding us about problems that we don't even know the level of people that are working for solutions. And I think people like you and the people that you're working with that are working in that area, it's important for us to know so that there's hope. Exactly. Yeah, and not just hope, but often, you know, we don't even hear enough about the the real practical ways that are being developed um, 
to, for instance, to address climate change or to address pollution or biodiversity or whatever issue it is that, you know, your or empowerment of women, you know, that you're particularly interested in, you can be sure that you find people who are, are working to advance that, just like, like you're doing with the podcast. Well, I want to know, what is post-traumatic growth? <laughs> I, I love when I went on your site and I was like, oh, oh so talk to us about that. <laughs> well, you've probably heard about post-traumatic stress, right? right. Or PTSD. <laughs> Almost everybody has. So um, about 20 years ago, when I came back from Asia, I got very ill. I was bedridden for eight months. Doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And I just collapsed. And so I couldn't quite believe how weak I felt and how despondent. And I wanted to research how people find growth from times when they went through a really hard phase, something really challenging. And so that's uh, when I learned that there's actually real research behind this term post-traumatic growth. I didn't coin it. It was coined by two professors, two psychologists at the University of Charlotte, North Carolina, Lawrence Calhoun and Richard Tedeschi. And they had been psychotherapists for decades working with trauma survivors from all walks of life. And they were surprised again and again that people told them, well, I'm not happy I got cancer, but I learned something from it. I think I'm a better person now. And there's this, you know, saying, uh, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, uh, which is not always true. But um, they did find that up to 94% of people experience post-traumatic growth. And what they mean by that is not really growth from the trauma as such, but growth from working through the trauma. And they found that the post-traumatic growth mainly happens in five areas. It's personal strengths. We kind of find out what we're made of. Deeper relationships. We realize who our true friends are, who's really there for us when it counts. Discovering new perspectives. Appreciating life in a more intensive spirituality. And, you know, we often think of trauma as the end of our world. Um, we'll never get better. We'll never find joy in life again. And I think this research, along with the very practical methods and tools that they have found help people heal and grow from trauma is really encouraging. Well, I love that. In fact, I wrote it down. <laughs> I wrote down the five things you said, because I, in my own life, you know, the trauma I went through as a child and some of the things I went through in my life, what I learned has made me who I am today. So um, I'm so grateful that you're that you're talking about that and and that that's what bouncing forward is, right? It's like moving through that and understanding the gifts that come from that. It was actually the great Maya Angelou who gave me that title. I, I got to speak with her shortly before she passed, uh, a few months before her passing, and she called it that. She spoke about bouncing forward because, as you know, Maya Angelou had plenty of trauma in her life. And she, um, I like the term bouncing forward so much. I made it the title of my book because resilience, literally the world, literally means bouncing back like a rubber tie that bounces back to its original shape and if you think about it when we've gone through something traumatic we're never really the same we don't go back to how we were before we're changed but we want to move forward with this uh, right and so that's why i chose bouncing forward as as a, a really great title for this research on post-traumatic growth, because Maya Angelou said, you know, nobody can do it for you. You have to keep moving forward. You have to keep ways to find living, to, to keep living and not just keep living, but find ways to help other people who might have gone through something similar and help them uh, cope with it and heal from it. And that's what she did. And I think, you know, when I started out, I thought, well, it's great people like Maya Angelou or Nelson Mandela, who, you know, who went through unimaginable suffering and came out as heroes. But the most encouraging part of my research is that I learned that really anybody can, uh, can learn these methods can learn to heal and and can can go through trauma and come out with new insights um, 
um, from this, you know, no doubt challenging and tough learning process. Very much so. So that brings me to like, where does Buddhism fit into this for you? Because I, I really want to talk about this other book. <laughs> so, what, that so actually, it was in uh, so when I was in Asia, I had always been fascinated by Buddhism. And was when I was in Asia, I started studying it. I started meditating, and in Asia, I came across um, the saying: a lot of the the older masters said, you know, cherish the difficult people in your life. We call them precious jewels. Cherish. Um, the the hardship you'll learn something from it the, the Dalai Lama said your enemies are your best teachers and I thought well they're just saying that you know so they were nicer to each other they can't po possibly mean that but they really did mean that and what impressed me so much was I met a lot of refugees from Tibet who had lost everything their homeland often their loved ones uh, sometimes they had been in prison for for many years just for practicing their faith and they were among the kindest, most compassionate people I've ever met. And I was quite young and ambitious, and maybe I also had a, quite a fair amount of anger within me. And I was so impressed how they could have gone through such hardship and be such wonderful people. So I started researching it. And that's actually um, what brought me to Buddhism, what brought me to meditation. And in my view, Post-traumatic growth is like the scientific side of it. Uh, that that's actually it goes really well with what Buddhists believe, because for instance, uh, psychotherapists or even the army, the U.S. Army, they also use meditation now to deal with trauma. So there is actually a great overlap. They are in many ways recommending some of the same methods to to heal from trauma and to work through difficulties. Yeah, it's, well, that's so incredible. So I was in Dharamsala and I was at the Novalinka Institute for the Dalai Lama. And I had the same experience about the people there who had been through all kinds of things, you know, come across the mountains and still these loving hearts. And you can see I have a, a, a Buddha in the back of me. I, I, um, um, I, I think that the heart of meditation and I think healing takes place at the spiritual level. Yeah. It's not about a religion. It's really about you tapping into that space within you. So I want to know, where did you start looking for these 12 extraordinary women? And why did you look for 12 extraordinary women that were shaping transmission of Buddhism? So I started, you know, going to Buddhist teachings, meeting Buddhist masters in Asia. And uh, at a certain point, I realized they were all men. There were no women. The women were in the audience, the women bowed to the masters on the throne, but the masters on the throne were all male. And so I'm like, well, where are the women? There must be women. And so I purposely started seeking them out. And of course, there were women, very wise women, but they, especially in Asia, they didn't really sit on thrones. They were more hidden. And um, the nunneries were usually far away in the mountains. You had to hike three days on foot to them to find them, whereas the monasteries, we, you know, would be much uh, easier accessible. So I really, um, I really sought them out, um, both Asian women. And then I also found uh, Western teachers who had incredible life stories, like a, a surfer girl from Malibu, who ended up heading up the biggest um, Buddhist organization for women worldwide, who became a nun or, um, uh, a Jewish girl from California who is now uh, the abbot of uh, a monastery in Washington State. So I wanted to know what had propelled them to seek out this path, because as a young woman, I was also struggling. It's, you know, it's such a different culture and women aren't quite taken as seriously. I believe the Buddha um took them seriously, um, but, you know, his successors were mostly male who were in power, and uh, they delegated women to second place. And so I wanted to change that, and I also wanted to, to make these women um, a little better known. Some of them had already written books, but some of them hadn't, and I thought it was really their life stories that were so um, inspiring. 
Well, I am so glad that you did that. So, okay, ladies, that book is Bikini Power. And then the other book that we talked about is Bouncing Forward. So, okay, how do people find you? So I have a website. If, uh, one website is actually called dakinipower.com. Um, you can find more information about the Buddhist teachers there, the female Buddhist teachers I interviewed. Dakini is D-A-K-I-N-I. And Cynthia, you earlier you spoke about awakened women. So that's actually what the term Dakini means. It actually <laughs> means awakened women. <laughs> so that's why I chose that. And uh, the website where you can find more information about bouncing forward and post-traumatic growth is on my personal website, Michaela Haas, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-H-A-A-S. Not like the avocado, not with two S, but with two A and one S. <laughs> well, um, ladies, I hope you will go and find this. I mean... Uh... I intend to read more about what you're doing because I, I just find it so fascinating. I, I I work with a lot of people who've had stress and I do mind body work with them, but I love that term, you know, the post-traumatic growth. So I asked the same last question on this show of every guest. The show is called Women Awakening. What do you think is the one thing women need to know about the importance of their awakening on this planet at this moment? Well, we're we're holding up half the sky, right? And what women need to know is, actually, I want to say our own power. We need to know our own power. Um, coming back to Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, there's this figure of the Dakini who can be quite powerful, quite wrathful even. Uh, she's often pictured surrounded by a ring of fire. And... I think to become aware of our own power and not to shy away from it, not to shy away from expressing it and living it. Um, that's what that means for me. Well, and you are such an example of that. Uh, clearly, I'm so grateful that you've come here and um, shared with us. And um, I'm honored to know you. Thank you, Cynthia. Same here. Thank you. So, um, ladies, I, I want to say the same thing that I say to you every week. You are a masterpiece in the making. You are extraordinary. You have unique abilities that cannot be duplicated anywhere else because they're you. So whatever it is that lights you up, whatever brings passion forward in you, go for it. Step out, step up, step into your power. You know, I mean, bring that bikini forward. I mean, I love that. So the world needs you. We're waiting for you. In case you hadn't noticed, there's a lot going on on the planet that I think if women were running it, it might be a little more peaceful. That's just my opinion. So have uh, an incredible day, an incredible week. I will see you next week. Know that I love you and I'm so honored to be with you. Many blessings. 